Welcome everybody to the 189th uh, meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Um, and uh, actually, uh, today is, uh, just in case you didn't know, it is the uh, Chinese Lunar New Year's Eve. So um, go out and, and enjoy the restaurants uh, this week. Uh, there's going to be a lot going on. Thank you. I can't do it with any reasonable accent. Can you say that again? There you go. Uh, we're going to say it means go and eat a lot. <laughs> All right. So uh, tonight we're going to be hearing from two presenters on the topic of uh, C groups and C groups two in the Linux kernel. Uh, these provide granular control of resources. And I, by the way, I wrote this. If in any way you feel this is inaccurate, let me know. But um, my understanding is, you know, a good way to describe it would be granular control of resources for the Linux kernel. Um, the first speaker is uh, Tejan, who I've been told to not try to pronounce his last name, and Johannes Wiener is, I believe, correct, right? Weiner. Okay, Weiner. Um, <laughs> I'd like to say how much we appreciate Bloomberg for giving us this space. Uh, sorry for any uh, confusion, but I'm glad you all came out. Um, today we were going to be in a different room, and, and here we are now. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming, for being here. Uh, I know it's still a cold winter, um, but it's really, it's really great to see everyone, uh, and uh, oof, so I ran out of steam right there. Um, so we have, uh, tonight before we get started, we have our usual requests, and I heard one of them. First, silence your cell phones. Whatever you can do to keep them from interrupting the presentation will be much appreciated by your neighbors. Uh, two, do not eat snacks and noisy wrappers. Uh, Bloomberg provides us with a wonderful array of things in their pantry to share. Please uh, only pick at the quiet ones during the presentation. Um, and last, uh, please use the mics for questions. We will be uh, waiting uh, and holding questions until the end. We will have the two mics here active. So when the presentations have finished, by all means, please come up with your questions. Ask uh, so that the uh, recording will have your questions and their answers, uh, and that will be uh, for the best. Um, our next meeting, just so everyone knows, will be Josh Watsman presenting on HHVM, which is the next generation PHP. Uh, he's a Facebook engineer who's been working on uh, that. Um, uh, working on that. Uh, and anyway, that will be here again uh, in Bloomberg. I'm not sure right now which room. I think it's one of the other rooms, but um, that will be March 16th, okay? So put that in your calendar if that's of interest to you or tell your friends if you think it would interest them. Um, in addition to, our, uh, to Bloomberg, our space sponsor, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, past and present, uh, IBM, Canonical, Brandor, Google, and O'Reilly Media. Um, they have supported us for a long time and made all of these meetings possible. Um, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers. I think those of you who are regulars know who they are. Um, but, you know, give them thanks and come over, buy them a beer afterwards. Uh, that's a little self-serving, but please do. Um, so after the meeting, we do encourage you to join us at Bloom's Tavern, which is over on 58th Street between 1st uh, and 2nd, no, and just uh, right over here. Uh, no, between 2nd and 3rd. I've got to get this right. Second and third. Thank you, everybody. Um, but we'll be, uh, we'll be going on to the upstairs. We have it reserved, so uh, you can come and talk and discuss anything that interests you about the presentation, next presentation, whatever. But uh, we invite you to participate in that, too. Um, now we've come to our announcements portion of the meeting. Uh, our workshops, uh, we have a regular biweekly workshop where uh, you can kind of come in, sit down, work, maybe discuss what you're doing with other people. That, uh, if that interests you, please talk to da, uh, Dave, Rob, and David Bristow. They are hands up right, right here. Uh, they can tell you more about that. That is going to be at City College at 138th Street in Amsterdam. The schedule for that is at our meetup page. Um, in case you missed it, do we have the Linux distros up there? There are Linux distro DVDs if you're interested in trying one out and just haven't had the time to download or put one on. They are, there are DVDs out there you can use. They're free for the taking. Please try them out and see what you think. Um, does anyone in the audience have announcements of events or anything else that they would like to make known? Anyone? Any upcoming events that people would like to announce? No. All right. Uh, in that case, um, we're going to be starting with uh, Teo. Uh, Tejan? I'm sorry. I literally just spaced on that. Oh, yeah? Okay. You, okay, so a mention of techhunt.io if you're interested in looking. Event Hunt for tech event. Uh, eventhunt.io 
for tech events in the New York City area. Um, so give that a shot. I hope we're listed. Well, maybe we have to get on that. So um, I guess we have to get ourselves listed if that's not the case. Um, okay, uh, they are. They're just pulling from Fit Meetup. Okay, so we should be there. Um, okay, so. Uh, and one quick thing is after this, we will be having our regular trivia questions, so pay attention to some of the things. There will be questions at the end, and we have uh, some books and some ebook vouchers from O'Reilly to give away. So, um, Tejan, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, good evening. Hey, so, um, oh, let me unlock my laptop so that it shows up. Yes. So, uh, the pr presentation is named uh, Secrets and Secrets V2. Um, and, um, um, who here um, have ever used C groups? Um, indirectly or directly. Cool, there's a lot of people. Directly, I, I use C groups, uh, the kernel interface directly and configure things myself. I use something else. The, the rest use Docker or something else, right? Okay, all right. Huh. So um, C groups, um, um, to summarize, is a way to, I'm sorry, let me adjust it a little bit. It doesn't really show up here. Okay, so C groups, this is a one sentence summary of what C groups is in the corner. It's a mechanism to hierarchically um, divide the resources in a machine to allow ho hosting different jobs on the machine in a controllable way, in a controlled way. And um, this is a really high-level uh, description of it, and uh, we are going to go into, um, you know, what, what, how it's actually not implemented, but how it's designed and how it's supposed to be used, and what was the problem of C groups. We are talking about C groups V2, so obviously there was V1, and we are now working on V2, which is not released yet, by the way. Uh, it's just right around the corner, I, I hope. Um, I have been saying that for like over a year now. But um, so we are going to go into the details of what was what's original C groups and what the problem was and where we are headed um, at this point. So who uses it? Um, so who are using C groups? So I think uh, I believe a lot of people, most people here actually um, work on the server side of things, right? Okay. So um, obviously data centers. Um, and why do data centers want to use it? Right. Um, on, uh, well, huh, it's kind of fuzzing, but um, one easy question, uh, uh, obvious trend lately in the past couple of years, I think, is that um, people want to view their data centers, their, their fleet of servers as a homogeneous pool of resources. Right? They don't want to divide up their fleet to, you know, these machines do that thing, other machines do that thing. I mean, that's just painful. Not only painful, but it also is really inefficient because you end up having different levels of utilizations in different parts of the servers, and you, when you average up the whole thing, it's never, the utilization is never as high as you want it to be. Um, so when you can view it as a, a homogeneous pool of resources, you can just throw a task, right, a job, at the, um, at the fleet of machines, and then just ask that to run that, um, depending on your um, parameters that you specify when you're throwing that job to that fleet. And if that can be done automatically, then it makes things a lot easier, and it makes um, utilizing the resources avail in the, avail available in the fleet a lot um, more efficient, too. But um, if you think about it, right, if you want to um, view uh, resources provided a single server as a part of a homogeneous pool of resources in the whole fleet, um, there are problems, right? There are different classes of um, jobs that a uh, uh, server fleet need to execute, right? If you are, say, uh, let's say you are Google, right? If you're still, or you're Facebook, or if you're Twitter, there are a lot of jobs, um, batch jobs, right? Computational jobs, IO jobs, whatever, which doesn't necessarily need to be executed um, really quickly, but may take a lot of resources. And there are jobs which may not take a lot of time, a lot of resources, but which are under time constraint, right? If your customer is, your customer is connecting to your website and throwing you a query, and if you want to process that, right? And, and 
you have to be fast, right? It, it doesn't, it may not take a lot of resources, but you still have to be responsive to that, that processing. And if you want to throw all these different classes of uh, jobs on a single machine, I mean, on the whole, whole fleet, and, and in, turn, uh, in turn, in a single machine, then you want to be able to have a way to divide the machine's resources uh, in a very controlled manner, so that um, while a machine is executing a batch job, when you throw in an a interactive job at it, that you know, more or less, that the interactive job will have uh, enough resources to be executed in a timely manner. So only when you have that, um, you can throw different kinds of jobs at machines. And only when you can do that, you can extend to the fleet level and have this homogeneous pool of resources. So um, that's why, why uh, data centers use C groups at this point. And, and this has been really exciting. I mean, when I uh, first started uh, working on C groups, this was not really well developed. And people were still figuring out what to do. And I think people at NIST have, I mean, as a whole, at NIST have figured out what the problem space looks like. We haven't figured out uh, how it should be designed. So the design space is still kind of being figured out. But at least we now know what we want to do. And Androids, right, um, phones, uh, or embedded devices, or wherever you want to um, divide the resources in a controlled manner. Like on a phone, um, when you switch between a foreground job and a background job, when you uh, multitask, when you switch a job, like you want to give a lot of resources to the foreground one so that it can execute fast and kind of filter down the background ones. So that's where it's also used. So, um, so we, have, we had all that. Um, people have been working on C groups um, for quite a while now, seven, eight years. And, and let's call that V1. It's not the, the interface is really not version at this point. But let's say well, what we have now is V1. And what's wrong with it, right? What's wrong with it? So um, does anybody recognize what this um, graphic is? Um, no, this is actually a simulation of Brownian motion. Yeah, it's basically uh, when you um, track uh, a particle, not a particle, but uh, uh, ah, I forgot the word, but anyways, yeah. Yes, I mean, let's say you, you uh, track a motion of H2O, um, a single uh, H2O particle in water, right? Then it does this Brownian motion. It doesn't really have any direction, right? It just keeps moving in random directions. Yes, this random work, yes. Um, so this is, um, so the V1, while we were, uh, people were working on um, C group V1, we didn't really know, we really didn't know the design space. So we basically ended up what what's um, close to a Brownian motion in the design space. Um, so, so who here thinks um, of flexibility? Is, is flexibility a good thing? Yes, it's a good thing. Okay, no. Okay, sometimes. Yes, right? It's a, it's a dumb question, right? It's like asking, is a straight line a good thing, right? It's sometimes a good thing, sometimes it's stupid, right? The thing is that the, the C group interface, um, the infrastructure that we have, we, what we call C groups, the core of it is extremely flexible. Um, and it's flexible to the point where it becomes a hindrance to implementing um, actual features. So, and, and um, I, I will, uh, as uh, the presentation proceeds, I will I'll give you examples of those, but um, this um, extreme pursuit of uh, flexibility um, at the cost of other parameters is uh, one of the major themes of uh, design failures that we have experienced um, for C group V1. And the second one is, um, so when, um, how many of you know um, what iNotify is? iNotify, yeah. So it's, a, it's an interface to ask Connor to um, tell me if a file changes, right? Notify me if a file changes on the file system. That's what iNotify is. But before that, we had denotify. And after iNotify, we have also have something else. And because we, you know, failed to figure out the design space there too, um, which is a common occurrence, unfortunately. 
But the thing is that if you if you follow the history of this uh, file change notification implementation in kernel, right, each step was arduous. I mean, each step took like uh, several years. People argued over it, you know, endlessly. People had I mean, tried really hard to figure out what the right interface was. And the thing with Cgroups is the Cgroups um, interface is uh, file system based, and and because it's file system based, um, we change it back uh, what files we expose a little bit, then we provide a new interface, right? And it's kind of easy to add new interfaces. And this is usually fine, right? Um, this is usually fine for say, uh, SysFS or PROC kind of things. This is fine, not because, um, not because, I mean, these are not kernel interfaces that we have to scrutinize, but this is um, fine because there are differing levels of scrutiny that we apply, right? If you use, for example, CCTL, or even, right, if you go further, if you use um, kernel boot parameters, right? They, they, I mean, those are those also are kernel interfaces, but they are not really that heavily scrutinized because we know, I mean, there is this common expectation that these things are reserved for um, people who are maintaining the machines, or the distributions, or the base operating system. Um, they are supposed to know that this is part of kernel uh, details and they may change or break. And that's fine. Um, the, the systems which depend on that, the software stack which depends on those details are uh, fairly tightly coupled with the um, release of corners and it looks out fine. The thing is that um, with C groups, V1, um, what we did was that we kind of lost sense of that and we ended up exposing interfaces which is basically at the level of CCTL to individu individual applications. And um, this is really bad because you know, it, it, it hurts both user space and, and kernel space, right? User space gets interface um, for features that they, they, they um, legit, legitimately want. I mean, these features are fine, but I mean, these interfaces are not really, um, not well built. They're just this hack job of something exposed, so, which is something uh, exposes kernel internal details. So user space gets crappy interface, which is not stable and corner space gets locked into this, this um, corner details, which is, shouldn't happen, right? So there's this, uh, it harms both ways. So um, I, I told you about the flexibility, right? Um, the extreme flexibility and the shortcut thing. And the whole thing behind it is that um, we, um, as a whole, didn't really think about the use cases, we, we thought about how things would be implemented. And, and so the whole design is that we, the implementation didn't follow the design. Um, the design followed the implementation. And this, such a, I mean, this is a bad idea. Whenever you're doing that, you just have to stop. But we forgot to stop, we uh, failed to um, recognize that, and we just ran with it. And we'll show you along the way what I mean, uh, what I mean by that. So um, V2, so this, uh, um, this uh, uh, one sentence des description of V2 interface, a set of consistent interfaces and behaviors to provide a hierarchical grouping of processes and overlay various resource controls over the hierarchy. It's a long sentence, but I mean, that puts everything, that, that's a complete description of what Cgroups V2 will be and um, and like each part of the sentence um, signifies what's different from V1. So it said the first thing is that, um, well, consistent, that part is okay, but um, it says a hierarchy, right? One thing with, um, one thing with, uh, one characteristic of uh, C-group V1 interface is that you can have any number of hierarchies. You can have, there's no limit. You can have million uh, hierarchies on your system um, as long as you have enough memory. So, I mean, it, 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 uh, it makes like something simple really complex, right? Um, if you ask, right, if you ask in the corner, right, if you see a process, right, and you wanna ask, hey, what's your, I mean, which, to which C group do you belong to, right? If you ask that question, the length of the answer 
is unlimited, is not bound. So you cannot ask that question and get the answer and do something useful with that answer. And the, <clears throat> and the idea behind that was that different controllers, right? Um, so Seeger controls resource distribution primarily. And, and the major resources that it distributes are the major resources in the system. So CPU cycles, memory, and, and I.O., right? How, how, how fast you can write, how much, how much memory you can use, and how much CPU cycles you can burn. And people just figured out that it's kind of difficult to come up with a unified model of configuring them. So Cgroup's core just provided a, like a completely flexible way of categorizing, uh, uh, putting um, processes into this hierarchy. And there can be um, N hierarchies. And these resource controls can be attached to any, any of them. And any number of controllers can also be attached to any hierarchy. So a hierarchy may have zero controllers, um, or it can have all the controllers attached to it. And the rationale was that different controllers might need different um, categorization, um, which is kind of silly, right? If you, if, you, if you look at the system, right, um, there are different types of jobs, right? Processes, a uh, group of processes, would represent a job, a task. Um, it could be a service, right? It could be a, a certain server um, job. It could be a user session. It could be a VM. But um, once you have that, that um, concept of a task group, right, or a job, then, it's, then you can put that in a hierarchical order, right? Certain jobs would belong to certain department, right? Or, or certain class of service, right? Some, it, can, it could belong to batch jobs. It could belong to um, interactive jobs. But I mean, things should be, you should be able to categorize your jobs in a hierarchical manner. If you cannot do that, then you're probably doing something wrong. And, and the problem with C groups V1 was that nobody really made that distinction and just went with it and just do whatever you want and we're not gonna restrict anything. That was what it did. Um, so with um, unified hierarchy, um, what you try to do is that there's going to be a single hierarchy. So um, you can always ask, um, tell me which C group you belong to, and you will get one path. And you can do useful things with it now because you know you can name it. And the second thing is um, also, also what that achieves is that um, it um, separates organization from control, resource control. Um, you first organize your processes, your jobs, in a hierarchical way, and you overlay um, resource control over that hierarchy, over that logical structure of your processes um, as you need. So the hierarchical uh, organization is no longer uh, implemented in detail of each controller. Um, hierarchical organization is the logical organization of processes on your system, and you overlay resource control over them. And I said, I, I, so in the C groups V1, there are multiple hierarchies, and the controllers, like resource control can be attached to any number, I mean, different hierarchies, right? What that means is that um, when you try, when you have two controllers which have to interact with each other, you have no idea what's going on, right? So for example, um, IO controls um, how much um, this time or IO resource you get per given time, and memory, um, controls how much memory you can use in the system. Can anybody guess where uh, those, uh, uh, do they have to interact? Any guess? Yes, caching, right? Um, if you have dirty pages, that's a really good answer. So if you, uh, if you do buffer writes, if you dirty your pages, page caches, they have to written out eventually. And um, how much memory you can use, because memory has to be written out before, uh, before reuse for other purposes. That's directly tied to how much you can, how fast you can write write those 30 pages to your I/O device, your persistent storage device. And the thing is, I mean, in the C groups V1, those two could be using completely different um, categorization, and so they cannot really talk to each other. They really don't know. There's no way to cooperate between those two controllers. Again, I mean, this shows that uh, that the, that pursuit of extreme flexibility is actually getting in the way 
of implementing a feature which is actually necessary. And the flexibility was not necessary to begin with. So we are trading off the wrong things here. So um, this is a simple example of what, uh, how unified hierarchy uh, works. It's, it's kind of cryptic, but um, A, B, C, D, E, I mean, this is a tree structure. Those are all uh, C groups. And you can put processes into each group, right? Uh, there are other constraints, but um, let's say that you can put process into any group. And then you can enable, um, say, B uh, represents block I.O., M represents memory controller. And you can uh, enable and disable um, controllers at different level. And um, the table below shows that um, depending on where the process belongs, that which um, memory or block I.O. controller they um, correspond to. But uh, I don't know, I, this looks kind of critical. But the basic concept is really simple. You have a tree, and you can enable or disable individual controllers along that tree. And there are uh, extra structural constraints. Um, and the first one is that uh, we, uh, the secrets V1 is per task or per thread. You can put um, threads of the same process into different C groups. It didn't really work well. Um, the, one of the big problems is that for a lot of controllers, it doesn't even make sense. What does it mean to um, put two threads of the same process um, and give them different memory allocation, I mean, memory um, resource policies? It doesn't just, it just doesn't work. And there are also other uh, complications arising from that. So it's always per process. And um, it's top down. Um, you cannot distribute a resource um, which your parent hasn't distributed to you. Um, you're going to have to get from your parent, and you're always you know, passing it down from your parent. And um, no processes in internal nodes. So uh, this I kind of skipped over here. But um, if you look at this tree, um, root is uh, A is a root, right? I mean, root is a special case. But um, other than root, um, no internal node, no internal C groups can contain processes. So uh, in, in this diagram, only C and E and, and A, because it's root, would be able to contain processes. Um, this um, structural constraint exists because um, we want to, we wanted to, let's say uh, B has a process here. If B has a process, right, and, and B is competing against uh, C and D, right, a process in group B would be uh, competing against its children C groups, C and D. And the problem there is that now you have a process competing with whole groups. And th that configuration is not, it's kind of ambiguous what, what should happen, right? Uh, in, in the past, some controllers would uh, count a single task as equivalent to a single child C group, and others would put all the internal process into a hidden C group and let that compete equivalently with children's C groups. It is. Um, there's, there's a lot of ambiguities in, in allowing um, competition between uh, different classes of objects. So that's ruled out. And there's also a lot of other cleanups. Um, there were a lot of pointless complexities um, that um, which were really not necessary but still there and which are actually kind of getting in the way. In the same way that uh, I talked about the flexibility of uh, multiple hierarchies, that they were getting in the way of actually achieving um, something useful. So they were all kind of dropped. And basically the uh, idea is that we don't implement features because it's implementable. So we, we try to research the use cases and, and uh, implement um, use cases, uh, implement features which are necessary for the use cases rather than the other way around. Uh, one, and uh, general cleanup of uh, a lot of things, and um, one of the uh, important, one of the big pieces of the cleanup was the notification mechanism. So when a C group becomes an empty, right, uh, if the old process, it, let's say you have a, a web service group, which is serving specific uh, application, and if the old process is uh, in it dies, and it becomes empty, and you have to, you want to clean it up afterwards, right? So that's where the um, unpopulated or populated notification comes in um, so that the management software can tell whether um, a service is terminated or not. And that part was just uh, really badly implemented. It was, um, does anybody uh, remember the uh, uh, SBIN um, hot plug binary that kernel used to invoke um, whenever there was a, a hot plug event in the system? 
So it, it was basically the same thing. Um, whenever an event happened, um, the kernel would try to pork a process with uh, certain parameters and environment variables. And that was the way of notification, and which is not really reliable or scalable. So that was, oh, and it was also not recursive, so it couldn't delegate it in any way. So that got fixed. And a lot of those like small fixes, and there's numerous uh, number of those fixes. And that's the, um, the, the core got cleaned up that way. The core got, um, core now enforces, the core now enforces um, these rules to the controllers. Core now expects certain behaviors from controllers. Uh, in Secrets V1, the controllers were actually dictating how the hierarchy would behave. And when you mount one, when you um, use one controller and you use a different controller, the hierarchy may mean completely different thing, even if you have the same hierarchy. That's no longer the case. Now the uh, single core dictates what hierarchy means and how it behaves and what it expects from controllers um, in terms of uh, resource control behavior. And to, to, to achieve that, um, we had to clean up a lot of controllers and, and um, have to change the interface of those controllers significantly, um, which is still ongoing. Um, and so that's uh, what major uh, portion of work is going on at this point. And um, well, one of the um, um, controllers, uh, the memory controller, is a really good example of what's going on and what was wrong before and, and how we are trying to clean it up and what the, the design process of it is really uh, well um, shown in, in MemCG. So um, Johannes uh, Weiner is um, going to present about MemCG. Thank you. Hello, hello. Does that work? Yes? OK, cool. Um, um, so I'm Johannes. Um, I work on the uh, Linux memory management, all kinds of allocators, uh, page cache management and stuff. Um, most recently on the memory controller of C groups. Um, so as TJ said, uh, we had a lot of interesting uh, design and implementation challenges with uh, resource-specific controllers aside from the C group core architecture. Uh, I think the memory controller is probably the most interesting uh, example simply because if you l compare uh, if you compare the other major resource like IO time or CPU time, um, these are renewable, right? So you have a small addition, more or less small addition to these respective schedulers, and they can just uh, adjust how they hand out their time slices to the processes depending on the C groups they're in. But when you look at memory, this is a, a, a persistent physical limited quantity of, uh, of resources that you have. And uh, we need to keep track of the memory that we have at all times and be able to uh, recycle it and so there's a lot of tracking and, and, and state involved in this. Um, so the reason we need a memory controller in the first place is that um, uh, when you look at how operating systems traditionally implement caching policy and the swap out code, um, what they do is they, they, try, they try to keep the uh, the data in cache that is most recently or most frequently used, simply because that's the most likely data that the system as a whole uh, is going to need in the near future. Um, so what that means is that if you, as TJ said, if you combine batch jobs and these interactive user sessions in, in, a, in say, a data center of some social network, or <laughs> um, you don't want these to step on each other's toes. And you don't want the, the batch job to, to grab as many resources as it can at full CPU speed, at full disk speed. And then you have this interactive session, a user that, that clicks on one link, reads some page content, and clicks on the next link. That guy doesn't want to wait for all his data to come back from the disk, right? It should stay cached. So we really need some way of, of isolating this. Um, So this is where the memory controller comes in. Uh, what it basically does is it, it takes that, that one global cache, that one big policy that is optimized for maximum throughput on the system level, and it allows 
to break that down into smaller per C group caches that can be con completely controlled independently and that don't interfere each with each other unless uh, you, want to, you want to do that to a certain extent. Um, so now you have, you have a machine or you have some computing resource and, uh, and uh, you have a bunch of jobs that you want to execute, different jobs with different cache access patterns, different lat latency requirements. So how do you actually configure, um, how do you actually configure the memory controller uh, for those things to, to fully utilize that machine? Uh, so one thing you can do is um, you run each, each workload that you want to run later on concurrently on that machine. You just run it once in isolation and you look at its, its, its cache footprint, whatever memory it's used. And then you go and you, um, um, and you take that, that what you have overall, the entire memory that you have, and you divide it by the, the size of each job. And it leaves you with the number of jobs that you can theoretically uh, schedule in parallel and that should execute fine. Uh, two issues with that is that um, you have to, two things to consider that would make such an approach really inefficient. And uh, one of them is that um, when you consider how, uh, when you consider how the Linux cache works is that basically any data that's ever been used is going to be it's going to be kept in the cache until we really run out of free memory and the cache is forced to, to kick some old stuff out to make space for the new one. So basically the idea is that any free memory is wasted memory. So this thing is going to expand whatever you put in there. Uh, the issue here is that um, when, you, uh, when you look at most workloads is that they have a, 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 a decent share of their data that they only use once and they just never look back. For example, if you uh, consider how, how, a kernel, how the kernel is built, <laughs> familiar example, um, you, have, you have a big project, there are thousands of source files in there, and you have the compiler that, or the make job that goes through there, compiler reads one C file, it, it translates it to an object file, and it moves on, and it just never comes back to the C file again. So there was really no point in adding this to the cache and growing the cache footprint for this because there's just, it, if it kicks it out or not, the, the job doesn't benefit from having this. So if you don't discount for this, um, you're going to waste a lot of memory just by looking at the end footprint. In reality, you can, for most workloads, you can just trim down that available cache significantly without, just, without sacrificing any performance. Um, the other thing is that even after you do this, um, the, the demand, the footprint, of each job, the minimum required memory that it needs is not even constant during the execution of a workload. Um, so if you go back to that kernel build job, and let's assume you, you just you built with a couple threads, not too many, and then um, they go through the kernel tree again and they, they translate all the object files. And, and during that time, the, the cache that you could get away with is fairly small. Right? You, need, you need a little bit for the compiler to stay in memory, to, for the executable to run. And you need a little bit of space for the, for the source file and for the object file that you're going to write out. So this is fairly constant for most of the time during the kernel build. And then at the end of when, you, when you're done creating all these object files, you have the linker that comes in and, and suddenly tries to just combine this whole thing. And it needs all the object files at the same time in memory. And all of a sudden, your resource usage just goes up. But just for a short time over the duration of your job, right? Um, so you don't re really want to um, distribute your, your, divide up your memory based on those short peaks either. Because if you look at the big scale, consider, say you're building a thousand kernels or whatever, you have a thousand batch jobs running in parallel, and they only have very short-lived peaks during the execution of the whole thing. You don't want to, you don't want to optimize for those peaks, right? If you have a thousand things running in, uh, in parallel, it's very unlikely that any of these peaks overlap. I mean, some will, but it's very unlikely that all of them at the same time just hit them, hit the machine at the same time. Um, so there's no reason to do that either. Um, so what we really want to do in, uh, with the memory controller is uh, we don't want to give it a single value um, to define the memory consumption. We want to give it conf uh, define a range. And so the upper end of that range is uh, that, that really frugal maximum that I said, 
that, that you know the, the job is going to live com comfortably in, but beyond that point, it wouldn't benefit from any more cash. So you, you kind of set that where you know everything beyond that would just be used once data, and there's no point in keeping that. And then the lower end, you want to set to that, um, to that average minimum requirement, for example, with that, that build shop to where the compiler runs and not where the linker runs. Um, and then, so, so you have these thousand jobs running in parallel, and some of them will peak eventually. Uh, as long as they're not, everything's fine. But as soon as one of them starts to peak, basically what that, what that, that lower end of the spectrum tells the kernel is it, for each job, it defines a line, and everything above that line is, is luxury and it's nice to have for the job, and everything below that line is just, it's the required minimum. Below that, it will just start thrashing. So below that, it will run a deficit. And so you have these, you have these jobs running in parallel, and when some of them start peaking, the kernel just can go out and look for the, for the groups that are running a deficit, the jobs that are running a deficit, and go to the group to the groups that that are running a surplus, and then just rebalance and give, take where it's not needed and move it to where it's needed. Um, so um, I think all of these concepts were understood at the when the when memory controller was initially designed. Um, but when it comes down to just implementation and just really implement, I mean, just designing directly how the user interface is supposed to look like and how it's going to perform. Um, it's really hard to get this right on the, on the first go, right? Especially since this is a massive new new uh, problem space. And these the same people that did the memory controller, they did the block stuff, they did the CPU controller, they did the C group core. Right? It's massive undertaking. So a lot of a lot of design decisions that they made in the beginning might have might have looked like a good idea back then, but it turns out over actually deploying this and, and trying to use it um, that there are significant downsides in both usability and performance to to some of the decisions they made. Easy to say now, but <laughs> so one of them is that um, that upper boundary where you define the upper end of the spectrum where you expect the, uh, the workload to, to consume um, is implemented as a really strict limit or it's, it's also called an out of memory kill limit. So what happens is the um, once the workload hits that limit it tries really hard to recycle its own memory but if that doesn't if that doesn't manage to keep up with the demand um, the task is just going to get killed. Right. I mean, so you better really know the value. You're better sure about the value that you're setting this to. Otherwise, you just have your job killed after calcu for like calculating for two hours, and it's just gone. So you better know. The problem is that uh, in reality, working set estimation is the uh, term of this is really hard and it's really inaccurate too. And uh, so, if you consider, for example, a, a workload that has multiple threats. Um, that use their own, that have their own m impact on the memory consumption. Now, you, you, you benchmark this, this job in isolation to figure out how much it needs, but I mean, just by threat timing differences, your peaks might align differently and it just, you, you, cannot, even, you cannot even estimate in advance exactly and precisely how much memory it's going to use. Um, so you have the choice about uh, between either setting this thing, uh, this upper limit too generously and then you risk just wasting resources. It's just going to be slack that nobody uh, is using. Or you're setting it too conservatively and you risk getting your jobs um killed at any, t any point, really. Um, but the thing is, nobody really wants to waste memory and nobody really wants to kill, uh, get their jobs killed. What people added to address this problem was they still made it a, re a very strict limit, but what happens, instead of killing it, they allowed the user to disable that um killer to kick in. But at that point, the kernel doesn't really know what the user tried to accomplish. Does he still want to kill these tasks, or does he want to make some corrections to the limit? So what it did was it just froze the job. It just, just stopped dead in its tracks and just waited for some, I mean, 
waited for some user space application to come along, figure out what the situation is, and then make the corrections. But again, if you, if you scale this to, to data center size and you have a machine that runs thousands of groups and you have this one dopey user space application and that tries to figure out what happens with possibly hundreds of them uh, stopping and freezing at the same time. I mean, both for batch shops, I mean, this is a massive de uh, degradation in throughput. And for interactive shops, I mean, this is our, these are unacceptable latencies. So this is not really a good solution to the problem. Um, then the lower end of the spectrum, the way it was, uh, the way it was defined was um, that it, instead of defaulting to zero, what you would expect from a lower end of something, it defaulted to infinity. And so really what it did was that uh, per default, all the groups were running a deficit instead of all memory in the group being a uh, being surplus, what you would think it w would be the logical thing to do. So I don't know exactly why they did it this way, but the consequences in implementation is that if you don't configure anything and you have a couple hundred groups, um, one, uh, what I said earlier, once, that, um, once there's one group with a deficit and it needs to allocate memory, and then the kernel needs to go off and find all the groups with the surplus to skim some memory and rebalance, that is really expensive if that if you have a couple thousand groups and you have you know you have only have one or do, not any at all that have a have a surplus so the kernel needs a very fast way to figure out during that time is there is there a group with surplus or is there not and where is it all right so the implementation is kind of uh, complex because it needs that that tree lookup and and needs to do a lot of work but so even even though the implementation is so complex, it didn't, it didn't really uh, work out in practice because what happens is um, what you optimally want, if you have some group that's running a deficit, you want the kernel to go out and skim from every group that has a surplus just a little bit, just a little bit off the top and then take it to, to move that back to, to fill that deficit. But since even looking up a single, a single surplus group is already so expensive, what it did instead was it just went straight for the biggest surplus group and just beat the crap out of it, just took it for everything it had. <laughs> and so not only is this really unfair, this is really unfair to, to that, that nice donor group that gives you some of its leftovers and crippling at that too, because I don't know, it's just taking way too much to make that, that one chance count. Um, but it's also, it takes forever on the receiving side, right? You have somebody that just wants a little bit of memory and it has to wait for the kernel to go out and punch that guy and just, it's just, it's not good for either side. So in, in, while this, this seems like a good idea, it, it didn't really work out in practice and it, it actually configuring a, a system optimally com, uh, according to these values in test made it, made it perform worse because it would cripple that donor group and just made the other guy wait forever. Um, so aside from these um, decisions, uh, Um, there were also a couple of uh, intentional shortcuts. I think TJ also mentioned this briefly earlier. Um, so the problem the original authors of this of the C group stuff had was that even before it was merged in its really early stages, it was just a massive project. I mean, it it was enormous in size and it covered so many different subsystems. So in order to get this stuff, do you have a chance at getting this merged? Oh, and these were, these were um, a lot of these uh, guys were, were not really familiar with the kernel too. So they, had, they came from the outside and had this idea and they wanted to do this, but they weren't really familiar with all the subsystem code to really implement this. So in order to get this stuff merged and, and trying not to upset too many subsystem maintainers in the process, um, a lot of the design decisions they made were really to avoid having to touch the subsystem as much as possible, to stay isolated in their own code files as much as possible. And so a lot of times they did that, the code actually turned out for the worst. So this was really not driven by, we want the best code there is, but it was really a political, we want to get this merged without upsetting anybody. Um, so one example of this um, was that, um, so they wanted to implement that you, you can not only limit the, me the amount of memory that e each group uses, but you also can limit the amount of swap space that, that a group can use, right? Makes sense. Um, 
the problem with this, uh, the way they implemented this is that you cannot limit the swap space that a group can use independently from the memory. So they had two knobs. One of them is just memory, and the other knob is memory and swap combined. All right, so you cannot, you cannot really set the swap space lower than the memory space because that would restrict your memory usage too. Um, and the only reason they did this was that um, by, guarantee, by guaranteeing that, the, that memory and swap are exactly the same thing, they guaranteed that at any given time that that old original swap code could swap all the memory that is in a C group without having to care for any restrictions from the C group side. Right? So the only reason they did this is so they could get away without teaching the original swap code anything about C group specific limitations. It could just it would you would limit the memory in the first place and then just whatever memory it got it could also swap up. That's it. So you cannot really limit swap space lower than memory, but if you have a, a ten gigabyte workload and it uses ten gigabyte of memory, you don't want to you don't want to give it 10 gigabyte of swap. This is really excessive. So what a lot of people want to do is just give it a little bit of overflow space. And unfortunately, you can't do that. Um, so for a lot of use cases, actually, it's, not, it's, not, it's useless the way it's implemented. Um, another issue was that um, where they cut a corner was that initially, even though the C group core supported had a notion of hierarchy where you can where you can create one C group and then you can nest C groups inside there just through the file system you can create child directories that represent uh, child C groups so the memory controller didn't just didn't implement this and so even though you could create these nested groups um, the semantics from a memory standpoint was they were completely unrelated you can nest them as much as you want but when you look at the memory, it, uh, they were just completely unrelated peers. They were just at the same level, and it was just not acknowledged at all. So they added statistics and control interface and everything. And when they later added support for hierarchy, um, at this point, you, you need different statistics. You need different control knobs. And they just added this on top of, this, of what they already had. And just creating this huge mess. It's such a convoluted interface, really unclear what is what control knob controls which behavior? Does it only affect the local group? Does it affect the group and all its children? It's really unclear and messy. And all the statistics are duplicated for the same reason. Um, so how did we fix this in V2? So <laughs> one of the easy things was to just, um, just teach the swap out code what C group limitations are. And, um, and that, I mean, that's really all that's needed. So you can set swap limits that are smaller than memory. And it will just, it will just check, check back with the, with the C group when it tries to swap out. And if it's full, it's just full. It will just abort the swapping and fail to reclaim. Um, um, the other thing was that the, the version 2 of the memory interface, it, it just from the get-go, it's fully hierarchical. So if you create nested C groups, it's not an option. It's just it's automatically there. So if you create, if you create one group and you create nested groups inside there on, in the file system, they're automatically children. And so all the statistics in the parent level, they're, they're automatically the aggregate statistics of all the children. And at, in the same, at the same time, all the control, the memory limitations and the, the, the ranges that you configure in the parent, they all automatically apply to, uh, to all children. Um, so the low boundary, as I said, that def that defaulted to infinity, uh, was switched around to um, to default to zero. So if you're out of the box machine, the um, the rec the reclaim code, the rebalancing code, has a really easy time in finding um, in finding those groups that are in the surplus to get to serve those that are in the deficit. Um, so because the surplus, the surplus is now the default case. So basically, the, the, uh, this allows us to simplify that rebalancing code drastically because basically the search algorithm turned from um, searching the needle in the haystack to just using every single blade in the haystack and just jumping over the needle 
So it's a lot more, it's a lot simpler to implement and it, the, the behavior is a lot preciser because now it, it really, it doesn't only have to use the biggest surplus group to, to, to rebalance, it can just get a little bit from all of them and, and, and just take what's absolutely necessary. Um, the upper boundary was, was changed from, a, from that strict limit that would just kill everything to, um, um, to be much more forgiving. So what, what, still, so what happens when that, when that group can no longer fit um, in, into that defined uh, range that you, that you specified, uh, it'll get heavily throttled. But during really high pressure and you have multiple threats hammering at the same time and you just really misconfigure that upper limit, it's temporarily allowed to exceed that range. Um, so that obviously that breaks the isolation, right? You, you want to contain this thing, but all of a sudden you can, you can breach its containment. But at the same time, you have, if you again look at the, the big picture and you have thousands of, of, of jobs running at the same time, that little extra that, that one group needs can usually easily be compensated by whatever slack there is in the overall system. So this really isn't, an op isn't a problem. At the same time, um, exceeding this limit and being throttled heavily gives you, gives you a gradual degradation in, in the performance of your workload. So instead of just, um, and, and this is something that the user can monitor. So what this allows you to do is that you can, you can all of a sudden you can set this upper, upper end of the range that you want to specify, you can set it fairly conservatively. And all that's gonna happen if you get it wrong or, or too strict is that your application will start thrashing and, um, and, and you, get, you get notified about these events that the limit has been breached. So this is something the, the user space can look out for and then gradually adjust that upper limit until you, you just hit the optimum, the optimum uh, value for that, for that workload without risking either that just catastrophic ending of, of your workload or wasting memory. Um, so once that is done, we also don't uh, no longer need that uh, uh, that user space um handling because we can just gradually make make these adjustments. So that that feature of just freezing the job in some undefined random kernel state that doesn't really <laughs> is I don't know that's gone. So that's over. Um, so yeah, I think this was this was everything for me. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, so everyone has questions. If you just want to line up, I'll turn that mic on as well, just one at a time. Two of you now. I, do I get to ask two questions, I wonder? <laughs> um, well, first of all, thanks for the talk. That was very interesting. Um, the two questions that came to mind Please pick whichever one you uh, prefer to answer. The first is looking at the hands in the room. Um, a lot of people are using C groups indirectly. Um, and, and having worked on libraries that are used by other libraries, I know one of the challenges is to get the consumers to actually adopt this stuff. Because none of us are C groups, or very few of C groups consumers directly. So what do you think the chances of people like Docker or other people actually making use of C groups v2 and not just sticking on C groups v1? Just an interesting question. And the other one is, um, a lot of the discussion we were hearing here sounded like you know, task negotiation at this level, and I'm sure a lot of people here have heard of things like Mesos or whichever, which do another set of task negotiation with very similar types of parameters, memory, CPU, and so on, at a totally higher level of the stack. And I'm just wondering, you know, are, we, are we actually duplicating stuff because we don't know about each other? Is this the same stuff at a different level of granularity? I mean, that's a bit of an open question, so I'll just leave it there. Um, so the first question, um, as far as how, how do we get these projects to adopt V2? So the thing is, um, all, these, uh, all these design optimizations that I talked about, they don't really, they're not just nice to have. They don't really exist in this vacuum that, or in our minds that we just wanna clean this up and have it nice and proper. So if you, um, the test that I ran personally on, on a couple of machines was uh, really showed that 
by having this more fine-grained control and this, this more gradual degradation of jobs and, and being able to, uh, to, to just both control and monitorability are, are a lot more precise. And, and so I think, so while we maintain, we have, obviously we have to maintain we want there are people out there using this and, and they rely on this and we can't break their interface. But the things you can do with V2 really are better. I mean, just in terms of, even if you don't care about any of the design, if you start using that and you get better results, I think there's this, this built-in incentive to eventually switch over to that. And I think people will do that. So um, another uh, aspect of that uh, answer is that um, like for, for uh, mid-layer software like <coughs> Docker or what, whatever library that you use, adapting to the new interface is not that hard. And once um, the middle layers um, adapt them, the uh, consumers of, of that layer, uh, it doesn't really matter to them. So uh, w moving on to the V2 interface is not that hard thing to do for, for a lot of cases. So um, please lower le le uh, resistance there, and there are almost critical features which are missing from V1. Uh, I talked about it, but um, because uh, in V1, it's not really possible to um, memory controller to, to cooperate with um, I.O. controller, which means that in v, if you're using V1 hierarchies, um, all your um, buffered uh, writes are not going to be controlled at all. And, and your mem controller would have, um, so uh, th the thing is that um, when you have a certain amount of page cache allocated to you, you only, you only want to um, keep certain amount of that to be dirty. Otherwise, whenever you try to write something, you know, you have to wait for I.O., right? You, you want to be writing uh, constantly in the background. And, and that, that pressure uh, propagation requires everything to work, uh, talk together, right? Work, work together with each other. And that's just not implemented. That's just not implementable in V1 interface. So there are these critical um, differences in, in terms of feature. Um, so I think there's uh, enough pressure for people to move on to V2 interface. Um, cool. Yeah. Thanks. You guys, um, you guys mentioned in the answer to the previous question, and you kind of implied through some of the points in your talk, that um, you have to keep so support for V1. Um, but a lot of the improvements you were discussing were like code simplifications and data structure improvements that seemed would only be realizable if V1 could be thrown in the garbage. So I'd like you to sort of describe like what's the migration path? Like can these be both used simultaneously? How is this transition going to work from V1 to V2? No, so. Um it is true that if you look at uh, several core code right now, it's just massive uh, amount of complexity there. And, and a lot of uh, that complexity arises from the fact that we have to um, support uh, both V1 and V2. Um, so there, there is no question that uh, it adds a lot of burden to, to corner side. And I don't know, I mean, that's just the way it is. And, and, but I mean, what, and it's, what I, I tried to do was that uh, try to uh, make it make the um, additional complexities uh, coming from that, that um, transition confined as much as possible in the stable core code so that uh, each implementation of each controller um, is not as convoluted. Um, so we are going to have uh, problems with that in the, in, for, I don't know, maybe a decade or maybe a half decade. So we're going to have to uh, keep that um, massive uh, chunk of code we don't really need or want. But um, they are fairly isolated, they can be isolated, and, and um, I, I think it's doable and we are doing that. It's a headache, but we have to do it. Mm -hmm. So does your machine have to be configured to be only V1 or only V2? Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, you can actually mix a V1 and V2 hierarchy together. Um, the only thing is that, um, the only thing is that, so um, when you have a hierarchy, and, and hierarchy means that you are organizing your process into this tree, right? And then you put controllers on top of that to control resources. So the only decision that um, decision point where you're making V1 uh, against V2 is that whether you put a control a given controller um, to a V1 hierarchy or to a V2 hierarchy, and that can be configured um, during boot. And yeah, so there's no no hard, you can switch between the two during the transition period. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned that V2 is. Um, on a long, slow path to release, but you said hopefully soon. When do you think you'll have some clarity about how soon? Uh, I don't know. So I mean, so I've been I've been saying six months uh, for two years now, 
<laughs> but I, we are really close. Um, the core part is uh, almost completely ready. Um, all the core features are there. Um, all the interfaces are there. And now we are in the process of cleaning up each controller um, to V2 interface. So that, because, I mean, we cannot, I mean, single core without controllers is just doesn't do anything. So we are in the process of cleaning up each controller um, up to, up to uh, V2 mandates, V2 standards. And um, MemCG is uh, one of the biggest ones, and MemCG was almost getting uh, the new interfaces um, um, already merged. So we yeah. are getting there. So, so they just went upstream in this merge window. It's, it's, it was open, I think, last week. And um, so the new interface to set that, that to configure that range, that's already done. So what I have in my own tree right now is that new swap controller. Um, but this is probably going to go in the next merge window. So, um, so I think the release is going to be uh, gradual. So at first, we are just going to um, release uh, enable controllers which are ready. So uh, not all controllers are going to be available uh, for the V2 interface from the beginning, but um, uh, it, it will be a, a staggered release. And I, I think, I, I'm fairly sure that uh, this will happen and is gradually uh, from six months from now, in, in six months from now. <laughs> yes, six months. I promise, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it seems like we don't. Does anyone have any other questions? You think? Uh, oh, you do. Good. Uh. Hi. Um, can you discuss uh, the level of interaction you're having with the consumers of these interfaces on the user land side? Uh, certainly, a lot of the challenges that come up with creating a new kernel interfaces. You know, two guys are building something in the kernel, and then you put it out there, and then all of a sudden, the people who actually need to use it realize, oh, yeah, this doesn't actually work for what we need or you know, doesn't meet our, you know, uh, our long-term requirements. Can you talk about the interaction that you're having and how you're trying to work with you know, the people, you know, the, the dockers of the world who are trying to consume this technology? Well, I mean, so there, there are already, already like half a million of different libraries to access C groups. So if you change the interface, you can just say use that other library that people are really open to. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think maybe the question was for those things that are very active projects, are you able to interact with them and get their feedback rather, like, quickly rather than having to have a long wait time to realize that something's gone wrong mm. um, in the design, so, right? Is, is that sort of what you're asking? Or really, how involved are they in this development process? So how involved are they? No, so, uh, so we, re we well, have... for six we months. Have, yeah, we have talked to other... <laughs> yeah, six months. We have talked to uh, to some of the users definitely on a, on a really uh, uh, tight feedback loop because they 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 usually once they have a certain size and they really rely on this on this implementation they really make sure they they test uh, brand new kernel releases like this I already have bug report this was just merged I already have bug reports against that version two of the interface so the the turnaround loop is actually fairly quick I think. So um, um, from core side, um, so because we were um, trying to um, impose a lot of restrictions which weren't there before, so there were actually a lot of resistances. There were actually we, we fought a lot with people, um, and um, I think I, I, and I spent a lot of time talking with people and talking with um, uh, users of C groups, and um, I don't know. I mean, the thing is that um, I am fairly sure that I figured out, say, 90% of the use cases and the new um, interface is able to cover that. And, and um, after the initial uh, first, you know, uh, CBR fighting uh, phase has passed, right, and we kept, I, I kept talking with people I met in the conferences who are users of C groups, right, uh, whether this would work, I mean, what do you think of it now? And, and the responses I get um, is uh, fairly positive, I think. I mean. Some people might not agree with my evaluation, but I, I think we are um, we are having enough um, traction or, or, or um, feedback from people, um, and is to to say that um, this is not um, entirely wrong. So we may have to make adjustments, but I am uh, we are talking with people. So mm. I mean, one, once you make such a massive change with something that a lot of people are, or not a lot of people, but some users are. Are really heavily entrenched and they rely on this so much of course they're going to resist everything that you try to change because they they figured out how to use this and they figured out how they can work around the quirks and 
they they beat it into submission somehow. So if you come and you just say we're going to change everything because this doesn't make any sense, they're gonna they're gonna be angry, right? I mean, they're they're not gonna like this. But as you as you talk to them and 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 try to understand their use case and make sh and make sure you you keep track of what are people actually doing with this, and you think about that while designing the new one, then you have something that you can tell them and say, look, we we know what you're trying to do, and here's how I think we can do it with an implementation that makes that's a lot more universal, a lot less niche and specific. And so after that initial fallout, I think a lot of people have gotten on the bandwagon and say, we we know this is going in a direction where we can still use this and we know the consider the use cases we have. Even though we have we might have to adjust a little bit, that that basic thing we're trying to achieve still works. Speaking of resisting change um, so you talked about the memory controller. Um, so with the company I work at, we extensively use C groups, and one of the things we've gotten, so we rely very heavily on the um killer, killing things when they start to go a little over the top. So you mentioned that you've changed things from being a hard limit to being sort of a softer limit where things get throttled. So what happens when processes go totally overboard? If mm. something goes far, far beyond the limit and isn't reasonable. Is yeah. the um killer still an option? Or is you mentioned that you had gotten rid of it. Is it totally oh, gone? So or what is it, what, no, no, what I got rid of was that, that option to user space handle um kills so that you would just freeze the whole thing and then wait. So this is gone because I think the use case for that is gone. Um, what, I, what I did change was that, that, so before you had this strict limit and this other low limit that would define the range that you can use. Yep. And I added a new knob that would set the, and that, that should be the preferred way of setting the upper limit. And that's the thing that can be exceeded. However, there are use cases that where you say they either have buggy, buggy applications that they might not even trust, or they, they're trying something like uh, uh, stuff that parallels does, that really they want to build containers, they want to build wor virtual machines based on, on, on C groups. And they want to be able to to rent out this SSH, uh, SSH shell to just random untrusted people. Yep, but that's I what mean, we're doing. Yeah, they, those guys, they still want to the umkill. They don't care about how efficiently they can pack their machines if one guy can just take out the whole thing. So this is still an option. These knobs are called uh, memory low, memory high, and then memory max is the absolute strict limit. And that's still there. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, if you're gonna, yeah, if you want to ask the questions, I don't want to end this prematurely. I think we have a few more minutes, so please just come on up right now. You don't have to wait for me to ask. I just want to make make sure that if we end, we end. So come on up with your questions, and uh, I'll hey. leave this alone for now. So I guess building on the last question, um, what happens if um, all your processes want more memory at the same time, and there's no one to steal from? Um, then you have the option either. So if you get lucky, I mean, so the thing is they're, they're, gonna, they're all going to go into the reclaim code and trying to get something for themselves. So, but since they all need different things, it's, it's, it's likely that, that one of them at least makes progress and moves on and gets down from its peak. So and if, you really, if you really hit bad luck, right, and everybody wants it and nobody can get it, then the global um killer will still kick in. Okay. And it will just still. Um, so I, uh, also in the new version I added this that, um, the um killer before it would just look at every task in the system as just individual task. It just didn't it didn't have any C group knowledge whatsoever. So what what I added to the um killer was that once that global thing kicks in, it actually considers for each task um, how much of that range that is configured of its C group is actually utilized. If you still go after the ones that are fairly high into their into their range and try to spare the ones that that still contribute to that global shortage, right, but, but don't actually that much, relatively speaking. Thanks. You uh, brought all sorts of uh, new failure modes I, I hadn't thought about with the old C groups to my <laughs> attention. Um, but one, one area that I, I've got fun use cases for, I run Hadoop clusters. So I, Apache Yarn takes advantage of C groups v1 today. It doesn't look like it has a Jira yet to move to v2. But um, is network uh, uh, C groups work? And I'm curious if there's any uh, interesting pathological changes that come about there. In network. So my understanding of it is uh, today with uh, V1, I can tag 
traffic leaving my box for TC via C groups. And um, I can't find a way that that could be pathological and do weird things, but I didn't know if you guys had encountered anything. In oh, so, yeah, this uh, actually, well, I wanted to mention it uh, during the slides, but I kind of forgot. Um, I, I was running out of time. But the thing is that, so if you, uh, there are two um, controllers um, which um, are related to network in groups right now. And um, one is NetPrio and the other, I forgot. But anyways, I mean, it's like, uh, it's a really uh, interesting thing, an interesting question. So the thing is that, why do you need that? What does that controller do? If you think about it, right? It's really just naming things, right? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a way for the network stack to ask where do you belong? And, and it, it asks it by having a separate controller. And the only reason why that was necessary was because you couldn't ask, you couldn't just ask where do you belong without controller? Because there could be, you know, new, I mean, and, and hierarchies. So you really cannot ask and get an answer and act on it. Um, so that's the reason why we ended up with those kind of controllers, which is just our naming things. Um, and which in the process made the problem worse because now we have more controllers and more hierarchies. And, and so in the C group V2, right, uh, that can be properly solved. I mean, we can just um, c uh, add a way to configure QDisk or IP tables to if the issuing process is in this C group, is, which is a single path, then do this, right? And that should work. That's that. Um, that's that. Because we had already had that uh, controller and we don't want to change, I mean, we don't want to break it. So there's going to, you know, they are going to be there the same way. But uh, any new features which need identification um, is going to just match directly against the C group. Thank you. That, that makes good sense to me. Uh, quick question about the access control. Uh, of course, the main C groups are probably set up by root, but I can imagine that I have a, a process that I control myself, and that process might want to uh, spot other processes and control the resources. So is there any access control related to C groups where children can manage the resources themselves within the boundaries of their own parent or whatever group, or how does that work? Um, so yeah, we tried we tried hard to make these um, these new control. I mean, this is one of the use cases that you might want to you, you configure this this one parent, and you say this is I all the controls I own as the admin, but then all the subgroups you 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 can delegate to some other controlling tasks to some some sub level management, and so we really made sure that uh, that all the control knobs that children can modify. Uh, are top, they, they just work like top-down allocated resources. So you cannot really override and grab more than your parent is already giving you. And that really, that works, if that makes sense. Yeah, follow up. Uh, th thinking about Unix permissions really, can I, as a non-privileged uh, process, change the for my children? Or does C group manipulation always require high privileges at all levels. So um, that, that part is still being decided um, what to do. I mean, so um, the thing is that uh, C groups V1 allows that, um, allows that uh, it's a file system interface and, and you can do a uh, uh, CH own or CH mod to give permissions um, to after a certain point, right? Just changing the bytes, changing uh, permissions of the files. But the problem with that, so I, I, in this slide I mentioned that um, it was C groups was being used as a way to shortcut um, of exposing kernel internal details to individual applications. And that's how it happens, right? You, you give um, permission to write to C group uh, uh, control knobs to non uh, unprivileged uh, applications. And they just run wild with it. And they, they bake all these C group um, manipulations into their Apache binary or whatnot. And, and the thing is, now you're creating, basically creating a new system calls without actually creating system calls. And, and you know, both sides are depending on it. So I am, I don't know. The thing is that, uh, like for, uh, say, a container uh, things where we still have, even when after delegation, even when we have a clear notion of management and application, I think it's uh, okay to give out a delegation, uh, delegate the control knobs to that uh, management um, entity which would have a cap, um, a capability, a kernel capability to do that. 
But um, as for uh, delegating control knobs to individual applications, I don't really think that's a good idea. And if, if um, the features which can be achieved that way is, are, are justifiable, then I think what we should do is um, having, uh, adding um, dedicated um, um, syscall interface to achieve the same thing rather than um, abusing C groups to achieve that. Just a question around the uh, freezer subsystem. Um, so previously, C groups is sort of where the, the whole freezing and thawing existed. And I know there was, uh, I watched a couple of talks where they were talking about um, essentially migrating processes between even different boxes using this, the freezer subsystem. How does that fit in a C groups V2? So, um, so C groups in, in, in it, even in C groups V1, so the behavior was non hierarchical, not hierarchical uh, to begin with uh, at the beginning, but uh, so it got fixed. So even in V1, the behavior is hierarchical. Uh, but the problem with Freezer right now is that uh, the implementation of how it actually freezes each process, each task, is just horrible. Um, so it was um, originally implemented as Freezer is, uh, was originally implemented to be used during a suspend and, and, and hibernation, right? The assumption there is that once processes are frozen, the system stops running, right? The kernel assumes that uh, any given task is uh, capable of uh, executing um, in a foreseeable future, right? Otherwise, uh, everything, there's the basic assumption that the kernel has. Whatever task there may be, um, whatever state it may be in, if you send a seek kill to it, it should be able to die. Uh, that's the basic assumption of, that the kernel has. And, and that assumption is broken during, um, it's okay to break that assumption during suspend and, 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 and hibernation because the system is gonna, not gonna run. But the thing is that the freezer, um, when it first got implemented, nobody really thought about that and just used the same, same facility to, to freeze these individual processes. So what you end up with is that you have these this threads which cannot run which cannot run even from the corner side. If you do anything to it, it just gets stuck. And, and it's a undefined, it's a, it's a thread which is in undefined state when seen from user space or even seen from corner space. While maybe holding locks. Yes, while maybe Something holding locks. Something that any other thread yeah. can then trip over yeah. and get stuck to and you have no idea what's going on. So um, this is kind of, in, in terms of uh, feature, it makes sense. The implementation is therapy is a complete digester right now. It shouldn't have happened that way. So um, the plan is to uh, re-implement it in a way so that um, it it uh, is close to uh, being uh, stopped by a uh, six stop. It, it'll be at the same state as a, a job control stop, but it wouldn't respond to um, actual job control signals. But you would still be able to still kill it. So um, it's going to be re-implemented that way, and then it's going to be um, made available on Secret V2. But uh, the feature is going to be there, but it's going to take a bit of time to make it not crazy. We have, we'll have the last question. How about? Just, just, to follow sure. on, just to follow on from that. And when, the, when that's killed through the signal, the, if it's holding a lock, the lock will be freed, right? Oh, the thing is that so the uh, job controls top sites um, are very well defined. Um, uh, so um, this is only happens, uh, a, a thread cannot uh, stop inside corner in random places um, from a job control stop. This happens right before um, the thread returns to user space. It gets trapped there. So it is guaranteed to not hold any lock at that point. And we're just gonna use the same point as a freezing point. All right. Can we get the lights up in the, can we get the house lights up? So I, we're, we've come to the end of the uh, question and answer of the presentation. We now have some trivia. We have a few books to give away and some vouchers. Do you guys have your trivia questions? I either, you, you have them ready? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is this. Um, they're going to ask a question. We're going to look, raise your hand. You'll get called on and hopefully the first person who raises their hand will be the first person we see and the first person who answers the question and you'll get a book or a voucher. Anyway, uh, the books we have today are, we have two Ubuntu books and a Perl book and three vouchers. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the temperature of the crowd is here, so uh, just come on up and take a look at them and take your choice, all right? Um, shoot. So, um, what are the uh, three major resources that C-Groups control? Uh, in the back, 
the bottle in your hand? Yeah. Memory I/O and CPU. <laughs> Come, that you got thumbs up. Come on over. You want to do another one? I didn't really read the readers and uh, the, the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You can make up anything you want. Um. No, do another one. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, where where do um, I/O controller and um, memory controller interact with each other? Where do they have to? Um, I saw your head in the gray hat over there first. Page yes. cache. Yes, right back of page cache. Yes. All right. Do we have we have six by we have six things? So keep Ooh. keep going. Oh, do another one. Okay. Uh. <laughs> well, let's let's try to at least get one or two more. Ah, okay, yeah, that's a good one. Um, when, when will be the release, initial release of V2? What's the time frame? Is it six months or one year? I saw year you first. <laughs> six months. Is that right? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I, I'll give you a yes. Come on. Come on. <laughs> we're, we're not going to stand on that one, though. No, no promises here. Just good intentions. Uh, do we have one or two more questions, maybe, if you guys? Sure. Um, do another one. <laughs> <laughs> Delegation. Uh, there we go. Yes, it's there. Um, huh. Oh, okay. So how many hierarchies can you have with secret V1? Uh, there you go. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions you might want to ask? Yeah. How many can you have in V2? Oh. Oh. Uh, in the back? One. That's right. Okay, and one more, if you guys have one more question, we have one more, one or two more things to give away. Do you think you can come up with? We have two more, but I'm not going to pressure them, so <laughs> any more than that. Do you want to ask one more question, too? Huh. Anything else? Huh. I don't know, I'm empty. All right, well, I, th I think that's it, just, uh, just for <laughs> this, this time. So thank you very much. Come on over to Boone's Tavern afterwards. We'll be going there. We have the upstairs, okay?